Hi everyone. Before I start this review, I want to very quickly mention that I was completely blown away with all the support and the positive comments I got on my previous video talking about this laptop. Am I one step closer to fame and fortune? No, not really. But it was all inspiring to see so many people watch my video and give such positive comments on YouTube and other social media sites. So before we begin, thank you guys so much for that. Now, onto our regularly scheduled programming. <laughs> The ThinkPad X13 is a strange device for me, at least when I looked at it from the perspective of buying a piece of tech. You see, generally speaking, I haven't really bought a serious laptop in a few years. The last laptop I bought was a Chromebook and it was $150 from Fry's and I bought it about four years ago. There was no stakes in the matter. If I bought it and it was awesome, great, and if it sucked, who cares? The point I'm trying to make is when you buy a device, a phone for example, you can only really choose between the smaller or larger variant and the only other option you have is either color or the storage space. With the X13, it wasn't that. In fact, the Lenovo lets you pick every minute facet of the specifications. You can choose exactly what kind of screen you want, how much RAM, the specific processor, whether you want a fingerprint scanner, backlit keyboard, or if you want your webcam to support infrared. It really feels like a Frankenstein device. That is to say, I don't think any two Lenovo X13s are the same, and I'm sure the same analogy holds true for lots of other Lenovo laptops. With that said, I think it's our due diligence to give this Frankenstein machine a closer look. And to make it a little bit more easier, we're gonna work from the outside in. It's no surprise, in fact, it's almost an industry meme at this point, but ThinkPads are engineered exceptionally well. If I can be honest, I'm a little salty about not having a fully aluminum unibody like the MacBook Pro, but this sort of begs the question, is aluminum really the standard for exceptional build quality? It may feel that way, but is it wise to have your entire laptop just be one giant heatsink? Now, with that said, I'm really pleased with the ThinkPad X13's execution. With the base measuring, I think it's 0.69 inches at its thickest point and tapering off slightly, it's definitely well constructed. Now, there is a very, very slight flex when you push down on certain points, but it isn't anything to scoff at. In fact, I think that the CNC machined aluminum does a great job conveying its rigidity. The palm rests are plastic, however. Generally speaking, having incredibly thin laptops that have managed to keep their weight down and stay ultra portable it's easy for manufacturers to skimp on hardware and design decisions, so I'm glad that Lenovo kept theirs intact. I did want to mention, I'm not quite as happy about the material used on top of the laptop. It really seems to hold all the natural oils on your fingers and sort of makes this laptop feel like a, a fingerprint magnet, essentially. I also want to quickly mention, build quality isn't just how a laptop feels in your hand or how heavy it is. When it comes to engineering, it's also important to consider how different components stack up next to one another internally within the machine. It's a daunting question, but if whatever you're holding in your hand right now were to fall, would it break? I do think that if this laptop were to fall from my hands, there might be a dent or a scuff or some kind, but I firmly believe that it would be able to carry on using as if nothing even happened. Now that level of confidence is worth paying for. The screen panel has a very slight flex to it, but still manages to be sturdy. The hinges give the credence that they can be used for years without having any issues. As mentioned in my unboxing, by the way, if you haven't seen it, I'll link it right, uh, right here. I really wish this laptop could be open one-handed. I like to think that Lenovo opted away from the one-handed open for the sake of integrity and longevity over aesthetics. It sort of feels like a backhanded compliment, but oh well. The display on the Ryzen machines has been a pretty big talking point. For most people, it's the deciding factor when buying a laptop. I mean, you can run down the list of all the things that are important to you and even be swayed on certain items. But when it comes to screen quality and integrity, that should never be compromised. Now for the life of the laptop, the screen is the one thing that you'll be looking at forever. And unfortunately, in the last few months, Ryzen laptops have consistently been a day late and a dollar short. So I ended up getting the highest quality display I could for this machine, which was a 500 nit panel with privacy guard. Now, for those of you who don't know, Lenovo has put in a feature for those displays, which when enabled, would distort the vertical and horizontal image from someone looking at the display at an angle. If you wanted the 500 nit option, you had to have privacy guard. And let me be as honest as I possibly can about this. When I turned on this machine for the first time, I was let down. And for two very, very important reasons. When I logged into Windows for the first time, Privacy Guard was still enabled and AMD's variable brightness feature was also enabled by default within the graphics card software. 
This was probably because I was running the machine off of the internal battery at the time, so that feature was on by default. My initial impression of this display was not good. It was dimly lit and it had poor viewing angles. Personally, I think this is a stupid move. No one cares about having a 15 hour battery life while they have to squint the entire time. But furthermore, it just gives a really, really bad first impression. So Lenovo, do better. I also wanna mention that this display is not bad at all, not by a long shot, but when you're comparing this display to the display on the MacBook Pro, you sort of start feeling like the kid who has to watch his friend play with all the nicer toys. I know lots of laptops have decent displays, but there's a reason why people buy an Apple with their eyes closed. Okay, well, that was a silly analogy, but the point I'm trying to make is that Apple's display is about as perfect as you can get on a laptop screen. It's 100% color accurate, it's perfect for creators, including anyone who's doing video or photo editing on the go, and it's even lit at a beautiful 500 nits at peak brightness. When you're comparing the Lenovo display to Apple's, it falls short, but not by much. Lenovo's display is still very nice and it does get noticeably bright. Maybe I'm just being too harsh, but I really just wish Lenovo gave me the option to get the 500 nit display with that privacy guard. Now, I understand the ThinkPad line of laptops is specifically marketed for business enthusiasts, but come on Lenovo, <laughs> you let us pick if we wanted every other option. Would one more really hurt you? Hmm? All in all, it would have been great if Lenovo shipped these laptops with the screens that they put in their P1 line. OLED or IPS panels without privacy guard. I'm gonna do the best that I can to show you guys how privacy guard looks on camera. It might be hard to tell as I'm using a DSLR to do that. To help illustrate what I'm talking about, I'm going to set the brightness to max. So here's privacy guard on and then off. Once again, on, off. I also want to show you guys how text looks at an angle with this feature on and off. The point I want to stick to you guys is that privacy guard even when it's off, it's not completely off. It still looks like it's on 20% of all times, even when it's been disabled. It's not the end of the world, I'm not super mad about it, but options, Lenovo. <laughs> I will say that if you are someone that often finds themselves in the middle seat of an airplane and wanna get work done without snooping eyes from people next to you, I think that you'll generally love the privacy guard feature. I got a chance to check out different laptops when I was visiting Costco this past weekend. And I have to say, the keyboard on this laptop is truly exceptional in the way that it feels. I remember when I was typing on other keyboards, for example, the 2020 MacBook Pro, their keys specifically felt smudgy, it was inaccurate, and it was not consistent when it was compared to the keys on the ThinkPad. I use a brown switch mechanical keyboard on my desktop. It's tactile and responsive, but there were even moments when I found myself going back to the ThinkPad to get a bit of typing done. Now the keys are nice and elevated, they have a solid travel and are easy to use. The back of the keyboard actually works really well and it has two different settings for a higher brightness if that's what you prefer, which is nice to see. But I will say that even when you look at the keys from a certain angle, it does look like the backlight is bleeding. I suppose I understand why, because the keys are slightly elevated to give the better typing experience, but that does result in some light leakage. I will say that I did find myself hitting the page up and down keys by accident, which was annoying. It's especially annoying when it's placed so close to the arrow keys, which I think it's used far more often than the page up and page down keys. As this is my first ThinkPad, I am looking forward to using the TrackPoint a bit more. I know that the TrackPoint has something of a cult following and to be honest, I really wanna get good at it. I've read online that using a TrackPoint is excellent for video editing because you can do a bit more, you can be a bit more precise and still keep your hands free or keep your hands near the keyboard. It will take some time to get used to, but I'm okay with it. There are two things that really annoyed me related to this keyboard. Put your knives down, folks. I'm happy to say that both of them can be solved. The first is that the control and function needed to be switched. From the factory, the function key is on the far left, but I really prefer the control key to be there on the far left, as it's one of the most important keys when using your browser. Also, I have these really big bear paws that I like to stretch from the outside of the keyboard layout. That is a very simple fix in the BIOS. It's right in the keyboard section. And for the next issue, when I would type very fast, usually my password, the keyboard would beep. According to Lenovo, it's a I'm not entirely sure what it's called. It's a fast key issue. It was particularly aggravating because I wouldn't actually lose the words I was typing on screen, but it would be still be subjected to the beep. Now this can be turned off in the BIOS, however. It's stupidly not in the keyboard section, but rather in the beep section below it. Moving on to the trackpad, it's okay. It isn't earth shatteringly amazing, but it isn't awful either. It does its job and manages to not get in the way. I fortunately haven't had any problems with precision touches. It's been very responsive in my opinion. I think unanimously Apple is still like the reigning champion here. I do wish the Lenovo's trackpads were bigger, like obnoxiously bigger. <laughs> I think it's slightly harder to do since the buttons to the track point get in the way, but it's not the end of the world. 
Windows 10 actually does a pretty good job about having um, baked in trackpad options. I've got two finger taps set to right click and the three finger taps set to essentially a middle mouse click. It makes opening links in a new tab on any browser significantly easier. I don't think anyone is expecting an exceptional video quality with their webcam on their laptop, but audio however is something I take seriously. Bad video is manageable and this one isn't great. As you can very easily tell, there's not a whole lot of dynamic range even with my giant light box that produces nice soft light and the video on this webcam blows it out, you can tell. Bad audio on the other hand is very unforgiving. Unfortunately for the X13, it really is woefully mediocre. The microphone in this machine is average at best and the webcam max quality is 720p. Now I have a few case fans running at all times within my desktop. It makes a very slight hum because it's on, but this microphone picks it up as if I'm sitting right next to my tower. You can listen to it right now. I wouldn't call this a cheap omnidirectional microphone, but I do expect better. Now this is particularly important now in 2020 when lots of people are working from home and schooling from home as well. We're in the middle of a global pandemic. Lenovo, your name brand recognition is such that you make business grade laptops. Do better. Let's finally take the bottom off and see the internals. By the way, it's nice to see the screws being held down by these little fasteners so they don't get lost. God forbid you drop one of the screws on like a shag carpet, it's gone forever. Might as well get yourself a new laptop. So obviously you've got your Ryzen chip here with a heat sink and a heat pipe to fan here. I would have loved to see two fans here just to help with the thermal throttling and then the heat dissipation like the 10th gen i5 MacBook Pro. Fortunately, Ryzen chips do run a bit cooler than the Intel counterparts. The speakers are down here and to the side. You of course have your soldered RAM and one M.2 SSD space. As I mentioned in my previous video, I went with Lenovo's smallest hard drive space option because I don't think it's fair to charge people an insane markup on hard drive space. Instead, I replaced the 2240 size drive with a 2280 size Western Digital 1TB blue drive. Yeah, it's not the bleeding edge of speed, but for my purposes and my usage, I think it's just fine. The overall scores between the hard drives weren't that much different. The Western Digital drive apparently has speeds up to 2400 megabits per second, but of course, it almost never reaches that speed. I'll put a link in the description below if you're interested in getting the same SSD that I have. At the time of recording, it was a little over $100 for one terabyte, which I thought was a good deal. I understand that 128 gigabytes, which this machine originally shipped with, isn't anything special, but if I can be honest, I was a bit underwhelmed with its speed. Now, I really expected something better, but just not marginal, which is what it is. When it comes to hard drives that Lenovo puts into their machines, I'm not impressed at least not with the speeds that they have originally to offer. I'm not sure if the speeds are faster on a 256, 512, or the one terabyte. The speakers on this laptop are very interesting and something of a surprise to me. Now they're here to the sides and they are downward facing so the, so the sound does get muffled when using the laptop on your lap or when you're sitting down on a couch. If you're using it on a table, there is enough clearance for the sound to get out without being constricted. Here's the interesting thing. When the laptop is being used on a flat surface like a table, the speaker itself is completely covered minus the one millimeter raise that's being provided by the rubber feet. What's unique about the situation is that the, when the speaker is completely flat on the table, the table itself bounces the sound back up. Now, some of the sound I imagine actually goes through the body of the laptop laptop itself, which in turn actually gives a richer, more full sound. It might be impossible to demonstrate on camera for obvious reasons, especially with song that you guys probably don't know. Uh, in either case, allow me to try and demonstrate. When listening to a bunch of my favorite tracks, I found that the highs were nice and clean. It didn't give the impression that the sound was bleeding out or that the speaker tweeters were just going to die from excessive sound waves. Even on max volume, the mids were pronounced and solid. The lows, however, are underwhelming. It's there, but it isn't filling the sound the way I would like. Now, I'm not, I'm not mad about it. I don't expect laptops to have subwoofers in them, so it's okay. All in all, this was a very welcome surprise, and I'm actually very impressed with the sound of this machine. I totally didn't recognize it until way after, but there's a tiny little emblem on the palm rest that says Dolby Audio. Now, I roll my eyes at stuff like this because it sounds like it's a marketing gimmick, but in this case, I'm actually thoroughly impressed. Thumbs up, Lenovo. So as we're continuing to move from the outside in, it's time to talk about the meat on the bones, the grits, the main course. Now I'm talking about the performance. Before we get into the semantics and the numbers, I wanna quickly mention this thing is a beast of a machine. 
Eight cores and 16 threads is quite a significant feat for any laptop to manage, and that especially holds true here. I was surfing the web, who even says that anymore? Running editing apps, working on Microsoft Word, listening to music, it was so refreshing not having to worry about the system stalling or worrying about how much RAM was being used. If this is the future of Ryzen laptop mobile computing, I'm seriously happy about that. I ran the Cinebench R20 a few times, and I made sure to put performance mode on just so I can take advantage of the full capabilities of the hardware. The scores were higher than on my water-cooled six-core i7 processor. Now this laptop came out to about, I think 28, 2900. I ran the test a few times and that was the median of the scores. I'm curious how much faster it would have been with a faster SSD or more RAM, if at all. But again, we're splitting hairs here about how much the laptop already has to offer. Adobe recently released an update to the Premiere specifically in version 14.2, which would have support for the Ryzen onboard graphics chips, including the ones found on the Ryzen 7 Pro chip within this laptop. Ryzen now supports hardware encoding for H.264 and H.265 formats, which essentially means faster encoding times across the board. I didn't get a chance to run an older version of Premiere on this laptop before the update, so I'm not 100% sure how much faster the encoding is. But from what I've read on Adobe and various other sources around the internet, it's roughly 30% faster across the board. It's pretty impressive stuff. My GH5, which I use to record all my videos for YouTube, records those files at damn near maximum quality. I shoot everything in vlog at 4K, 400 megabits a second with a 10-bit 4.2 color gamut. In layman's terms, it's very, very high quality. This file that you see over here when my face was fat is exactly six minutes long. The total file size is about 17 gigabytes uncompressed for a six minute video. This laptop is able to scrub through the entire footage without any real hiccups. I will say that when you start adding like, you know, more audio and video tracks and making transitions and applying different filters, it does start to use the CPU and RAM a bit more intensely. I imported the file into Premiere Timeline and exported it after applying a LUT or basic color correction. The total export time using the 4K YouTube preset, three minutes and 41 seconds. It's very impressive for a laptop especially. I have no intention of using this laptop to play games but Call of Duty is life. So I decided to throw it on here and try it out. The results were not so great. I bumped the resolution down to 720, turn all the textures and particle quality, tessellation, shadows, either to low or off. Despite this, the FPS jumped between high 40s to mid 60s the entire time. It would dip into the low 40s if there was a lot happening on the screen. This should not surprise anyone. Call of Duty is a AAA title and they simply won't allow textures to be turned down to the point where they literally look like one shade. Now that would be great, but it's also 2020 and at some point we have to move forward and not every game should be able to run fluid on like a potato. Not that this laptop is a potato, I'm just making that example. Also, I'll have you guys know, your boy got in UAV, so uh, yeah. Kind of a big deal. It was a total pipe dream, but I was really hoping that we can get into a stable 60 frames per second. That would make this entire thing totally playable. Once again, it's not a gaming laptop. The one white pill that you should take out of this entire situation is simply that if Call of Duty can pull between 40 to 50 frames per second, albeit low quality, games like League of Legends or Fortnite should be able to work at a stable 60 frames per second or more. That's pretty cool. I don't have a lot to say about the battery life that you probably don't already know. I would love to tell you guys that this battery life is comparable to that of like the Dell XPS 13. Unfortunately, it's not. I was able to pull close to about 10 hours on 75% brightness with the XPS 13. That's with a mix of web surfing, watching YouTube videos, listening to music, or just getting work done. Unfortunately, with the ThinkPad X13, it's between six to seven hours on similar settings. I always use the battery on the slightly less than middle mode for battery optimization. I don't need best performance based on the tasks that I was running. The total capacity for the battery is 48 watt hour. I would have loved to see it slightly more. I would absolutely sacrifice some weight to a battery capacity that was maybe 20% more. I think at that point, Lenovo would just want you to step up to the T T14S line. The one thing that I will say when it comes to battery and charging is that in 2020, it's such a breath of fresh air that laptops manufacturers are finally using USB-C for a charging port and not a barrel charger like before. Port unification across devices is such a great step forward for technology that I'm, I'm glad to see that it's finally here to stay. It would have been so nice to see the USB port for the charging on the right side of the laptop so you don't have to swing a power cord around the laptop itself. Lenovo mentioned that this laptop also supports rapid charging technology so you can choose up very quickly. I wasn't sure if that was a feature that had to be enabled in BIOS, but frankly speaking, I didn't even care. The laptop does charge incredibly fast and that's awesome to see. I went from zero to almost 100% within like an hour's time. One last important thing that I wanna mention regarding battery, when your battery is under 20%, I think, the laptop downclocks your CPU. It's unfortunately cryptically slow speed, which sucks, and but I get it. But it annoyed me that I couldn't just find a way to change it within Windows or even when I was plugged into like a hard line. I did do a little bit of research and apparently you can download apps and disable the downclocking, but honestly, when you're essentially just 
you have very, very fast charging on laptops, you're out of the 20% territory within like 10 minutes or so, not even. Now the question I posed in my previous video was, would this laptop still stand the test of time? The answer to that question, I'm happy to say, is a reaffirmed yes. Now this machine is legitimately awesome and I plan on keeping mine for at least a few years. I do want to mention that if you don't plan on doing any kind of creative work or stuff that will put your a load on a processor or a RAM, you probably don't need the 4750 and can probably settle with like the less expensive 4650 instead. The money that you save, you can probably put towards the RAM, which I think is a much better idea. Although I can't prove it, I do think that because the 4650 has less number of cores and threads, it may actually use less battery and probably doesn't thermal throttle as quickly as a 4750. Again, can't prove it, but I'm gonna take a wild guess. I do want to mention that this is particularly important. Do not get less than 16 gigs of RAM. As it turns out, Ryzen processors need RAM a lot more than Intel processors, and they really benefit from having enough to spread the workload and function properly. In this situation where RAM is soldered, definitely stick with at least 16 gigs since you can't upgrade in the future, at least not without changing the entire motherboard altogether. I really appreciate Lenovo not stuffing their laptop with arbitrary software. Dell, on the other hand, is arguably one of the worst offenders on this. When you first turn on a Dell laptop, it feels like you're looking at one giant advertisement for some other software. I understand some of that is used simply Windows' fault, but it's nice to see that Lenovo can tone it back and not spam their customers. Once I reformatted and reinstalled Windows, the first thing I installed was the AMD drivers from AMD's website. I then installed Lenovo Vantage, which was able to automatically find the other drivers that I needed. I didn't like that Vantage kept on asking me to download the AMD drivers, even though I had already installed them before. I downloaded it anyway so it would stop asking me to do it and then when I went to install it, Windows yelled at me and said, we think you already have a newer version of this driver, blah, blah, blah. So that was kind of annoying. I would love to have also seen a full size SD card slot. That would have made this so awesome. Lenovo should also give more options for screens. As we mentioned earlier, usually a 500 inch display without a uh, privacy guard, that'd be great too. But honestly folks, I'm really, I'm just nitpicking at this point. Once again, I do want to reiterate, this is an excellent machine and it's not just geared towards people that are doing something creative work. In fact, I'd say that it's really marketed to anyone that's working on a professional environment or even a student. The fact that it's light at 2.94 pounds makes this a very portable with a very decent battery life laptop. Lenovo often runs promotions on its websites for discounts, so look out for them before buying anything from them. You can buy a pre-configured machine from places like newegg.com, but then you're basically beholden to them about the specifications of the laptop, and you can change different components. After giving it a preliminary look, I do think that Lenovo.com is probably the best place to buy this machine, at least here in the US, and they tend to give the most competitive price as well. Anyways guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I did wanna mention that I do intend on releasing more videos, making them far more often and more regular. I don't want to do tech videos forever, but rather things that generally interest me, which usually happens to be tech, but you get what I'm saying. If you guys enjoyed this video, it would mean the world to me if you can give it a thumbs up, maybe hit the subscribe button. I would love to get to like a thousand subscribers so my channel can finally have its own channel name <laughs> and thus like an identity. Uh, that would be so cool. Uh, you could have been anywhere, but you were here with me. So thank you guys so much for that. Until next time.